फोर थ्री टू वन सर वी आर लाइव नाउ ओके सो थैंक यू वेरी मच एंड जस्ट मोमेंट सो एवरी वन गुड मॉर्निंग I'm sure that as we uh, start the proceeding, more and more people would join. So, uh, welcome back for the second session of hip preservation. And I'll ask Mandar to moderate the session. I'll ask all these uh, colleagues to make sure that your camera is off and you are you are on mute. Uh, once you are asking, you can unmute and raise your hand and ask a question. Yeah. So, Mandar, you can take over. so mandar's video is not is paused so i think uh, he might have some internet connection venkat are you going to talk first that's what mandar told me yeah so uh, i think uh, you can start and right. mandar will come back in a moment so yes, i will please. start sharing my screen yes please good morning everybody and um, thank you maulin and mandar for having me and this is uh, the second lecture of the series of hip preservation modules and i'm supposed to talk on femoral osteotomies for hip preservation it's just not for femoral osteotomy impingement as it's mentioned on the flyer so i'm going to cover uh, comprehensively about all osteotomies which we commonly do for hip preservation surgeries uh, and this is going to be a very short talk and please feel feel free to stop me in between if you have any questions and this will be the layout of this lecture i'm going to give a brief introduction on why do we need osteotomy around the hip and various types of femoral osteotomies the basic principles and indications of for various types of osteotomies and with a few case examples for better understanding of what we mean by different kinds of osteotomies there may be some overlap between mine and mandas lecture and uh, coming to the first point of why do we need an osteotomy around a hip joint the first thing which comes to my mind is to restore the normal anatomy so you can have a deformity around a hip like uh, if you see the x ray on the left side you have a coxa vara where your next shaft angle is decreased so there is a deformity so you can need an osteotomy to correct the deformity and the second uh, indication might be a dysplasia on the right side you have a dysplasia where there is a coxa valga as well as an acetabular dysplasia and if you have to restore a, the normal anatomy you might have to do an osteotomy the second indication probably may be to restore biomechanics so if you look at this hip the head is nicely sitting in the acetabulum if you look at the hip alone it looks all right the head and the acetabular relationship is normal but the neck length is short and there is an high riding trochanter which is not a good uh not good for the normal functioning of the hip you can have an extra articular impingement and um, you can have a trendelenburg sort of uh, lurching gait so to restore the biomechanics you might have to sort to an osteotomy the third thing is if you have a patient like this where the hip is not looking good sort of a destroyed uh, or in the process of destruction you might have to have a salvage for this hip so you need an osteotomy and fourth is not truly a salvage procedure because your hip is already destroyed we are not talking about one preserving the one. hip here but uh, this is one of the indications where you have to support the pelvis where to improve the gait of the patient so the first three is actually what we are talking as hip preservation procedures where we aim to increase the longevity of the native hip joint and the last one is the uh, procedure where we uh, try to provide a support to the pelvis so that the gait of the patient improves so pelvic support osteotomy so the osteotomy is around the hip are broadly divided into the femoral osteotomies which i am going to focus today and there are ones around the pelvis which i am not going to talk i think uh, will be covered in the next session if you look at the femoral osteotomies broadly we can uh, divide into various types based on the location of the osteotomy you can um, i'm not able to progress to the next slide one second and some difficulty okay so it could be subtrochanteric and if you do a osteotomy in the intertrochanteric region it's an intertrochanteric osteotomy at the neck level or at the head level so this is a classification based on the level of osteotomy where you do 
the other classification what we can uh, how we can classify is based on the correction what we aim at so if you are aiming to do a varus osteotomy it is a varus uh, you are aiming to varus the proximal fragment it is a varus osteotomy you can do it at whatever level you want commonly we do at the subtrochanteric level which we call as a varus osteotomy or a varus derotation osteotomy or if you are doing a valgus osteotomy again it is commonly done at the subtrochanteric level it is a valgus osteotomy for a coxa vara or you can do it at the intertrochanteric level which is commonly done for skiffy i am sure mandar is going to cover it it could be a southwick osteotomy or imhoser osteotomy you can do a valgus osteotomy at the neck level which is a done osteotomy or a modified done fish barmada or kramer which is the various types of osteotomy again for a heel the slip slip capital femoral epiphysis the next type of osteotomy is to alter the size of the fragments in the proximal femur morphology so the common problem what we face is the short neck or the coxa breva so what we have is called the neck lengthening procedures and we have various types which i am going to discuss in detail and uh, we do have head reduction procedures where you have coxa magna the head the size of the head is big and you can do a head reduction osteotomy so these two are size changing osteotomies and the last one is support osteotomy which is in true sense not a hip preservation procedure so i have just added this for completion sake which is a pelvic support osteotomy also called the shans osteotomy so this by and large is the all the types of various types of femoral osteotomies which is in our hands as a pediatric orthopedic surgeon to uh, do a uh, hip preservation procedure as well as a hip uh, salvage procedures so if you look at the various osteotomies as you move from the subtrochanteric level proximally the complexity and the complications increases so uh, the subtrochanteric varus or valgus osteotomy is a pretty simple and straightforward osteotomy osteotomy as you move proximally to an intertrochanteric or a neck and head osteotomy the complexity of the procedure increases you need more planning as well as the rate of complication increases so if you have to do a neck osteotomy or a head osteotomy the rate of avascular necrosis or chondrolysis increases and if you look at the indications as well the varus and valgus osteotomies are pretty much like bread and butter we do very commonly whereas the size changing procedures like a neck lengthening osteotomy or a head reduction osteotomy or a pelvic support osteotomy are rarer procedures so this is the other way around varus valgus are the common procedures in our day to day practice so this is a sort of overview of various femoral osteotomies which is available moving on to the principles the basic principles of femoral osteotomy so you have to understand that you need to have the opposite range of movement when you are planning an osteotomy so if you are planning a varus osteotomy you need to have abduction so you need to have a free range of abduction like this to have do a varus osteotomy if you don't have a free abduction and if you do a varus osteotomy you are going to create a hydrogenic varus deformity of the proximal femur the same holds good for the valgus osteotomy if you want to do a valgus osteotomy you need to have a free range of ad reduction in the hip joint for you to reorient the proximal femur and one must be beware of the soft tissue contracture particularly in conditions like cerebral palsy you may have a severe soft tissue contracture which needs to be taken care of while planning for the osteotomy and it is not necessary to remove a wedge always in a pediatric uh, practice unlike the adult practice so you can do a open wedge or an angulation translation osteotomy we always just do a transverse osteotomy and you can just angulate and translate the fragment i'll show some examples for you to better understand how we do a osteotomy and restoration of anatomical axis is one of the good principles to follow whenever you do an osteotomy in the proximal femur in order to avoid late problems to the knee joint and the uh, distally so let us look at specific osteotomies moving on to the varus osteotomy which is commonly in, uh, indicated in perthes disease which is one of the common disorders which we come across and ddh as well where we do a varus derotation osteotomy and cerebral palsy so what we do is actually a transverse osteotomy at the subtrochanteric level and where is it and usually in varus osteotomy we medialize the distal fragment and you can fix it with any implant of choice so the plate which i have put here is actually the proximal uh, femoral pediatric hip plate which is a locking plate which is 110 degree it is a fixed angle uh, plate 
you can use any device of your choice so this allows some amount of medial excitation at the end of your fixation preferably a line passing to the piriform is possible should pass through the center of the shaft of the femur this is actually called the restoration of the mechanical axis so you can do this procedure for in case of perthes or dh where the amount of wear is required is minimal you can do this with either a simple uh, dynamic compression plate or an blade plate or you can use a fancy uh, pediatric hip plate as well but when it comes to a, a cerebral palsy the hip where the amount of correction needed is more i prefer personally to use a blade plate or a pediatric hip plate let us look at some um, examples this is a 8 year old child uh, perthes with stage 2a early fragmentation with some amount of extrusion already happening so this is a simple varus derotation osteotomy with a prebent dynamic compression plate this is a standard technique uh, described by professor ben joseph it's a prebent plate so the problem theoretical problem with this technique is it does not allow medialization of the distal mm -hmm. fragment and i don't think there is any problem in the long run with this because uh, the results from uh, uh, manipal has been uh, good but theoretically yes we don't uh, uh, restore the mechanical axis this is a one year follow up you can see that the head has restored very well and uh, good remodeling of the osteotomy site has happened but off late we have found that we can actually medialize even, even using the regular dcp if you bend the plate in this fashion you create one more bend distally you can actually medialize the distal fragment and restore the mechanical axis and you can do a good varus osteotomy with uh, a simple dcp as well if you are uh, varus required is around 20 to 30 degrees range but when you have a patient like this with a cerebral palsy he with a huge coxa valga where your angle of correction needed is more i think uh, using a dcp can be technically challenging so the amount of bend you need to do is uh, enormous and it could be technically difficult so in this situation it is preferable to use a plate like a angle blade plate like this or a pediatric hip plate in which you can get away easily with a A fixed angle device. And next is a valgus osteotomy. The common indications are a congenital coxa vera, where your neck shaft angle is less. Heel skip is one of the indications, and non-union neck of femur again is one of the indications for valgus osteotomy. So the devices coming to the implants of choice again, you can even use a DCP, DHS blade plate again, pediatric hip plate. So the procedure. Uh, what i usually do is your subtrochanteric level i do a transverse osteotomy valgus is a proximal fragment and in valgus osteotomy unlike the varus osteotomy we tend to lateralize the distal fragment and you can fix with uh, whatever device you prefer to this is a pediatric hip plate again uh, you can see that it is 150 degrees plate compared to the varus osteotomy plate which has a bend this does not have a bend and this allows lateralization of the lateral uh, distal fragment and if you pass a line through the piriformis fossa again it passes through the center of the femur so in my practice if for congenital coxa vera i prefer to use uh, this particular plate and for heel the slips and non union neck of femur i am uh, happy with uh, the conventional dynamic hip screw which is works well in my hands again a quick case example it's a 9 year old child with a congenital coxa vera you can see that the neck shaft angle is 90 degree and your he angle is more than 60 degrees so indication for a valgus osteotomy so this is a pediatric hip plate and you can see that we have not done any wedges here a simple transverse osteotomy at the subtrochanteric level and we have angulated and translated it's a 150 degree plate and the plate actually gives the desired angle of correction and you don't have to worry about the uh, contact as such here there is only point contact and there is a huge gap on the lateral side you don't have to worry about healing in children it usually heals well like this this is one year follow up of this particular patient you can see that the osteotomy has healed well and the nice remodeling is it another patient a non union neck of femur in a 16 year old boy with a you know implant failure so this was treated with a valgus osteotomy with a fibular strut using a dhs and uh, you can see that the fracture has healed well and the osteotomy has united and remodeled well so for valgus uh, in a non union neck of femur i prefer to use a dhs this is a 20 year old uh, patient with heel slip you can see that there is coxa vera and there is some impingement which is happening 
So we did a valgus uh, flexion derotation osteotomy with again a DHS through a safe surgical dislocation approach, which we can displace the trochanter as well. And then osteoplasty was added and which went on to heal well in six months follow up. So in valgus osteotomy, you can, uh, the choices of implants is you can play around with uh, between a pediatric hip plate and DHS or an angle blade plate. DCP is very uh, cumbersome to use and it's technically difficult. Let's move on to neck osteotomy, slightly higher up, it becomes more complex. I'm sure Mandar is going to cover about uh, done and modified and I'm not going to touch about it. Moving on to the neck lengthening osteotomies, there are various types described by Moshes, Wagner's, Lascombs and relative neck lengthening procedures. The indications are coxa briva, where you have a short neck. The etiology could be anything. It could be a post septic hip, it could be a, a birthies. Let's see what are the uh, technical steps in each types of osteotomy we described. Wagner's was one of the earliest neck lengthening osteotomies, where you can see that there are two different osteotomy cuts which is made. One is the trochanteric, greater trochanteric cut, and the other is the cut uh, which is perpendicular to the shaft, the level of the inferior border of the femoral head. And you can see that the head is actually rotated, which means that the position, the relationship between the femoral head and the acetabulum changes. You are valgizing the uh, femoral head, and then there is a lengthening of the femoral neck. And this will be the final picture of uh, after the Wagner's osteotomy. So you have to understand that when you have an incongruously congruous hip, if you are doing a Wagner's osteotomy, you can make it more incongruous. So there is a change in the relationship between the femoral uh, articular and the acetabular articular surfaces for the orientation. Moshe's osteotomy was described in 1980. So it's a triple cut. He makes uh, three different cuts. You can see that there is the two cuts at the greater trochanteric level and one at the femoral uh, inferior border of the femoral neck is a continuous cut. And this fragment is lateralized. And in this osteotomy, the difference between Wagner and uh, Mosher is that the orientation between the femoral head and the acetabulum is not changed here. So the lengthening of the neck is uh, achieved without changing the orientation. So when you have an incongruously congruous hip, so this is a preferred osteotomy because the orientation is not changed. So in 1985, actually, Lascombs came up with the modification of, with the, of the Mosher's osteotomy where he thought that why we have to uh, why should we cut the greater trochanter into two pieces instead take it as a single piece and bring it laterally so that's what he did he brought the greater trochanter as a single fragment laterally and uh, that is called as lascombs uh, neck lengthening osteotomy and uh, later on came the relative neck lengthening which was described by professor gans which we do commonly now so if you look at the differences between all these three types of osteotomies all these three achieves uh, the primary aim of lengthening the abductor liver arm and increases the neck length in wagner's osteotomy in addition we achieve uh, correction of the coxa vera and it changes the orientation of the head and neck whereas in mosher and lascombe there is no change in the orientation of the head but in relative neck lengthening there is no change in varus and valgus so i will show a case example the 10 year old boy the post septic uh, sequelae of the hip joint with the coxa vera, you can see the next shaft angle is 105 degree with the 5 centimeter of uh, shortening. This was one of my earlier cases, which was done in 2012, I think. It's an adapted uh, Moshe's osteotomy. We use a distal femur uh, locking plate, we reversed it and uh, used it. And that's a eight years follow up. The same patient is left with about uh, 1.5 centimeters of shortening, but his hip is reasonably okay. So, this is a uh, Moshe's osteotomy. This is an 18-year-old uh, girl, the same X-ray which I had shown previously, in uh, Coxa Breva. And she had a surgery when she was seven years. We do not know what was the etiology and we didn't have the records of the previous procedure. And uh, so this is a, a relative neck lengthening <clears throat> where we brought down the trochanter. And how is it different from the traditional uh, trochanteric transfer so that Traditional greater trochanteric transfer was done blindly where uh, there is a risk of damaging the retinocular vessels, whereas the relative neck lengthening is done through the safe surgical dislocation approach where the retinocular vessels are preserved. So this is very nicely described. This is a paper which was uh, published in 2015 in the Proceedings of uh, the Core Donor Symposium, where you can see that uh, 
you do a trochanteric flip osteotomy like safe surgical dislocation and we remove all the stable part of the trochanter as well as the bump here and this is exactly what was done for the patient and you bring down the trochanter and fix it so by bringing down the trochanter and removing the stable part of the trochanter we are relatively lengthening the neck so that's why it is called as relative neck lengthening procedure whereas actually we are not doing any osteotomy to lengthen the neck so this is the two years follow-up of the same patient you can see that it has nicely healed well and she is not having any lurch so this is about relative neck lengthening and sometimes you have to remember that you might have to do combination of osteotomies in certain procedures and patients so this is a 13 year old girl who is having a painless limb again she had uh, some hip surgery at three years of age probably this is again a post septic uh, sick play so the present problem is she is having a high rating rated trochanter and she is having decreased abduction with internal rotation and uh, two centimeters of shortening so if you look at the x-ray closely uh, she is having coxa valga and uh, you know, on the lateral view you can see that there is a head is big and she she is having some cam lesion there is uh, coxa breva as well and high rating trochanter and the fovea is placed high which we call as fovea alta so we were planning to do a surgical dislocation approach and uh, an osteoplasty along with a varus osteotomy and a relative neck lengthening so this is like a combination of procedures in a true sense if you close watchly this will be like a reverse of the wagner's osteotomy which was which we initially saw like a relative neck lengthening where in wagner's actually you valgaize the uh, proximal femur whereas uh, the femoral head whereas in this we did a varus to correct the uh, fovea alta so the relative neck lengthening actually corrects the coxa breva and the high rating trochanter and the osteochondroplasty addresses the fai problem and varus osteotomy corrects the coxa valga and the fovea alta so we executed the procedure as, as per the pre operative planning this is a post operative x ray and that's the 3 month follow up of the same patient so this is a such example to show that you might have to do a combination of the procedures just one uh, simple osteotomy may not be enough in certain situations yet another example to show that you have to look at the acetabular side also so it is just not enough to look at the femoral side alone and is it for a hip preservation this is a 16 year old girl with bilateral hip dysplasia who came with symptoms on the right side first so we uh, first did a pao on the right side and then uh, in a stage fashion we she needed a valgus osteotomy with relative neck lengthening on the right side to restore the uh, mechanics and the anatomy on the right hip so you can see that we had to do a surgical dislocation approach relative neck lengthening valgus with lateralization of the distal fragment and this is the locking plate which we used to fix so this actually gave a good uh, restoration of the mechanics as well as the anatomy of the right hip and 6 years later she became symptomatic on the left side in contrast to the right hip if you see the left hip the neck shaft angle looks reasonably all right so we thought that we will be able to get away just with the relative neck lengthening because the neck is short neck shaft angle is okay so we were planning to just do a pao along with the relative neck lengthening that was what was planned and we did a pao with the relative neck lengthening this was the immediate post operative x ray where the correction was looking reasonably okay and uh, <clears throat> this is a long term follow up of the same patient where uh, she is at present asymptomatic but there is some loss of correction on the left side she is having uh, a suboptimal correction there is residual acetabular dysplasia and there is probably a non union of the pubis on the left side but she is asymptomatic and just we are waiting on her again a case example to just show that you might need a combination of procedures to address the problem you should uh, look at what are all the problems and plan a procedure according to the need of the particular hip rather than going by a defined uh, procedure as such on the femoral side and always look at the acetabular side also because hip joint is a combination of the femoral and acetabular side and finally a word about uh, uh, femoral head reduction osteotomy which is the last the proximal most part of the femoral side the common indication is uh, coxa magna so post birth you can have a big head which is called coxa magna and this was again initially published in 2015 by professor gans the goals after after head reduction osteotomy is to convert a aspherical uh, head into a spherical head and you uh, eliminate uh, fai by doing an osteochondroplasty and of course 
you reduce the head of the size of the head convert cops of magnet to a normal size head and you can also uh, address the problem of cox up breva by relatively lengthening the neck and uh, you can uh, displace the trochanter and address the problem of overgrown uh, greater trochanter and in this also you should remember to address the problem of osteoblast dysplasia because a lot of these patients can have an associated osteoblast dysplasia so there are two types actually there are three types i will tell about two types of uh, femoral head reduction osteotomy the one is the traditional osteotomy described by gans where the central part of the femoral uh, head is uh, removed by taking oblique cuts pelly came out uh, with his own technique where uh, the central necrotic part is removed with uh, vertical cuts so this is pelly's type of head reduction osteotomy and this is the traditional gans type of femoral head reduction osteotomy i'll just show a quick case a 14 year old boy with healed perthes you can see that there is coxa magna he was symptomatic having a symptomatic impingement so the problems here are coxa breva and uh, coxa magna along with uh, causing impingement so you can see that the head is so uh, huge intraoperatively and this is after uh, making the plant cuts we removed the central part of the uh, head which was looking uh, unhealthy and this is after closing the head fragment and provisionally fixing it with k wire and this is a post operative x ray you can see that the head size is now nicely reduced which is fitting inside the acetabulum and we have lengthened the neck displaced the trochanter and it looks nice after the femoral head reduction procedure and this is a two year follow up of the same patient there is no avascular necrosis uh, there is residual acetabular dysplasia definitely the patient is not uh, symptomatic at present but i'm sure that he is going to come back with symptoms and we might have to address this acetabular dysplasia sooner than later so to summarize uh, femoral osteotomies uh, do have a key role in uh, hip preservation surgery and there are various options available to date whereas in valgus osteotomies are the most commonly done procedures which are the workhorse osteotomies for hip preservation head and neck osteotomies have a hip a steep uh, learning curve and uh, you need an expertise to do that with a high rate of complications and the aim is to restore biomechanics with an impingement uh, free range of motion and uh, most importantly you should not uh, uh, forget the pelvic side because just addressing the femoral side and doing a femoral osteotomy may sometimes destabilize the hip joint and you can land up in hip instability or even dislocation thank you yeah uh, thank you very much venkat an absolutely excellent overview of all uh, the uh, possible femoral procedures for hip preservation uh, we can have a couple of quick questions uh, molin if there are any in the chat or uh, uh, if there are any any uh, questions from the delegates yeah actually uh, it was a great overview and uh, people have mesmerized the only question is when uh, after safe surgical dislocation venkat how do you decide the exact rotation of the head you know uh, or if when you trim you know uh, how do you decide that this part needs to go off is a you, you understood my question i mean uh, that there were two parts to a question you first part of the question was how do you decide the exact rotation of the head Yeah. If I am not wrong, rotation. And, and when you do the trimming of cam lesion after safe surgical okay. dislocation, how do you decide this part should go? You know. Okay. Usually, what uh, we have, what happens is I put the head back inside the stabulum and see what is the overhang outside the okay. labrum, and then we remove it. So it, that is a, a, a beauty of this uh, advantage of the safe surgical dislocation procedure. You know, you see everything. So dynamically, we can assess. so you can uh, remove the lateral uh, part whichever you think it is impinging again you can relocate back and see whether it is impinging and you remove slowly so you don't have to overdo so we usually go step by step so we remove little bit again you relocate and see if it is impinging again i dislocate that again, again i uh, remove little bit because this ideal is to have a template because uh, the hip preservation set by synth is has got a template if you have a template it's easy you have the template and you know mark the rim and then you 
just use the high speed burner and take it off but we don't have the template but mandar may be having the template i mean um, universal uh, made the templates i am uh, i am not using it so what i do is i dynamically assess the patient every time i relocate it back and uh, see if it is impinging and then i remove it so that's how Please. we do it banker uh, another question and is when you do, yeah you will get the experience you know you know yeah. that what part is impinging Yeah. The second question is when we are coupling it with safe surgical dislocation. You know, we want to immobilize the patient for some period of time, and then we have done this uh, cam uh, resection. Would not it lead to stiffness of hip, uh, or what do you do to prevent stiffness? You know, I don't immobilize the patients after safe surgical dislocation. Okay, I don't immobilize. So I immobilize the patient the next day. Non weight bearing. Non weight bearing. Yes. So non non weight bearing um, movement and then exercise in bed. That's yeah. what you do. So if it is a simple uh, osteoplasty following a safe surgical dislocation, I allow total weight bearing, which is not even non weight bearing. After a modified, then it's a non weight bearing. But if it is a simple osteoplasty, I allow total weight bearing. There is no need for non weight bearing. If it's only a trochanteric flip, I don't see any need for non weight bearing uh, walking. and we can give a cpm to keep uh, mobilizing the hip so cpm knee does help so if you are too worried to mobilize the hip even for modified done patient you can do a cpm okay one question from dr rudra how far we can achieve a spherical head after head reduction yeah so the head reduction osteotomy is uh, something which is so problem is the head can be uh, aspherical in uh, it's a three dimension head is a three dimensional thing the head reduction osteotomy can be done only in one dimension so in the other dimension we will not be able to decrease the size of the head so if you look at it so only in the sagittal plane we will be able to see that the head size is uh, decreased so that is one of the disadvantages of uh, head reduction osteotomy so we will not be able to make it like a perfect spear so uh, so many a times so i absolutely agree with venkat so many times uh, uh, my fellows uh, send me an x ray where the head is mushroomed and which is seen on the lateral view or the frog leg view and they say let's do a head reduction so as to get it back in so that is never going to get corrected with a with a head reduction osteotomy uh, mushroomed head which is seen mushroomed on ap view that is the only dimension that you can correct yeah on, exactly on the view, it's still going to remain mush mushroom you may probably be able to do a osteochondroplasty at the same time so as to have some amount of less cam but exactly increased diameter on the lateral view is always going to be seen even after a head reduction osteotomy so yeah. i was actually thinking why can't we do a biplanar osteotomy remove two chunks in both in ap and lateral views to get the head but it is not described yet i don't know it's too risky So I spoke with Prasad regarding it. What he said was he does something like a like what Venkat said, where he uses uh, cuts off a wedge kind of thing, which can correct uh, theoretically both plane deformities. But again, that is something which is uh, even more complex than a routine routinely complex FHR. Yeah, yeah. Right. So let's uh, let's remember that this is fellows round. So uh, any any questions on this valgus and varus osteotomies? so see it's very fascinating to see this locking plates uh, standing away from the cortex and holding the fragments well but one must know the technicality and planning of valgus osteotomy we would have some papers and we'll share with the fellows around i think if you don't have any question let uh, let's uh, mandar with your talk uh, thanks venkat it was great talk thank you thank you thank you yeah yeah so are you able to see my presentation yes you yes. can so uh, so after this fantastic lecture by venkat i'll be uh, giving an overview on hip preservation in stp um, so it's going to be a relatively basic lecture on just the overview of the the techniques rather than going into a lot of details except for probably modified done so let's go to the basics what is hip preservation basically it is a treatment to save the natural hip hip to prevent or reduce pain or to prevent or significantly delay replacement 
So that is exactly what it is. So we don't want hip replacement. We are pediatric orthopedic surgeon. We try to save the native hip. And we want to prevent this vicious circle of abnormal anatomy, abnormal movements and structural damage. This is eventually going to lead to OA, which is what we want to prevent. So we know about slip capital femoral epiphysis being one of the commonest adolescent hip disorders, which predisposes to avascular necrosis and early hip arthritis, seen more in overweight adolescent boys and has a wide spectrum of presentations and treatment modalities. And treatment of this is very controversial right from the basic less morbid in situ pinning to the extremely morbid modified done procedure. And the traditional tree teaching has been whatever slip it comes to you, you have to do an in situ pinning. This was a long term study. This was what was presented in that, that article and 38 years later showing a good, he good heel slip but with a huge cam. Later on, there was an evolution of treatment to open, open treatment, started off with the Dunn and the fish osteotomy, which initially gave good results, but later on showed a very high AVN rate of almost 30 to 60%. The renaissance happened at this place in Bern in the early 2000s by this man, by Professor Reynold Gans, who ushered in the present era of hip preservation. This was one of his first articles on the anatomy of the medial circumflex femoral artery, and this was the basis of which we, we started the treatment of CP. The surgical dislocation of the adult hip was described, which was basically a versatile procedure capable of treating a wide variety of intraarticular conditions, which utilizes the knowledge of the branches of the medial circumflex femoral artery and has a trochanteric flip approach with the extensile retinacular flap. This was combined with the traditional Dunn procedure into what we call as the modified Dunn osteotomy. However, should all slips be treated in the same way? So let's have a case. This was a 15-year-old male with a hip pain since three months. He's doing almost everything, just has mild pain and restriction of uh, squatting while, while squatting, and he is able to sit cross-legged. You can this, see this child. He has just mild outflowing of the left side, very minimal lurch. Just mild outflowing of the uh, hip. You can see on the left side as compared to the right side. Has an external rotation deformity of 20 degrees and has a positive Dremen sign. And on the x-ray, you can see that the Klein's line is positive and the Southwick's angle is less than 30 degrees. So this is a chronic, stable, mild slip. What happens when this progresses further? Another case, this was a 12-year-old boy, has a prolonged hip history of hip pain, more on the left side than on the right side. And the gait abnormality has increased over time and is currently unable to squat or sit cross-legged. And you have a gait like this. You see this child is walking very stiffly as a severe external rotation gait with an abductor lurch. And if you see from the other plane, you can see that he's barely flexing the hip. On examination, he has an external rotation deformity on both sides and has flexion which is restricted to only about 20 degrees. Now this is a very very bad hip. Here there is a very severe slip on the left side, a moderate slip on the right side and that requires a different treatment. So before we treat we should know what are the goals of treatment. We should prevent the slip from progressing, prevent FAI, try to restore proximal femoral anatomy as much as possible and at the same time prevent iatrogenic AVN because of our treatment. What are the options? So these are the four things which I am going to briefly talk about in my lecture. In situ pinning, in situ pinning with anterior osteoblasty, pinning with other proximal femoral compensatory osteotomies and the modified done procedure. In situ pinning, in situ pinning means in situ. There is no attempt at reduction. It is just the pinning which is done at the same position. It is a gold standard for mild to moderate slips is a percutaneous technique with a lower operating time. It basically prevents further slip from forming. As I described, this is a very long-term study, but this is a very old study, which probably may not hold proof well. I would like to uh, briefly talk about this oblique screw, which has been described by Dr. Prasad, an excellent method, where you can have a very lateral entry, go posteriorly in the neck and engage the head at the center. So this helps in management of the mild to moderate slips. It helps in the removal of the screw also if required because it's on the lateral side rather than on the anterior side. A recent article by Chris Souder and Dr. Dennis Wenger 
Note that it remains a safe and predictable method for treatment of stable slips with no AVN noted even in severe slips. So they have recommended it for even severe slips. Again, a bit controversial, but this can be used if you do not have expertise in any other method. My indication for doing only in situ pinning is if it's a mild slip or a pre-slip and prophylactic contralateral pinning. These are my only three indications for doing only in situ pinning. Another good, good method is an in situ pinning with an anterior oscoplasm. So what does that mean? You pin it in situ and you either use an arthroscope or an open method, mini open anteriorly and burr off the cam region. So you have this 13 year old girl, you can see that there's a big uh, grade one slip, but has a big cam anteriorly. You can see this. And that is what is really troubling her. This child came with severe anterior hip pain. So what you do is you slip, uh, you fix the slip like the oblique screw as described by Prasad. Go anteriorly. I don't use a scope. I do an open anterior method. Release, uh, the, uh, open the capsule. See the cam. And you can see that after burring, using a high speed burr, this has created a very nice correction of the cam. So my indication for doing this method is a mild to moderate slip with restricted hip in internal rotation, has a mild outto engage, but most importantly, has an anterior hip pain with tenderness. So anterior hip pain is something which needs to be treated with the treatment which is required, which is an anterior osteoplasty. But what do we do for such severe slips? Severe external rotation deformity, severely restricted flexion with significant Trendelenburg lodge. Well, there is a method where uh, which uh, Venkat briefly alluded to, basically in situ pinning with a proximal femoral derotating. What we should remember, so all these osteotomies, Imhauser, Southwick, I'm just going to describe the basis of it. In SCFE, the proximal segment is in varus. There is significant amount of external rotation of the distal segment and the distal segment is extended. So what we have to do is do a compensatory osteotomy, which is going to valgize it, which is going to internally rotate the distal segment and which is going to flex the distal segment. So you can do it at any method. You can do it at the or the South Wing method or just at the subtrochantric or the intertrochantric level. You can correct it, correct the deformities at a different level. So these are known as proximal femoral compensatory osteotomy. An excellent art article from the Ready Children's Group describes something which we call as a triplane proximal femoral osteotomy, where you can see that there is the proximal segment is the distal segment is externally rotated, varized, and in, in extension. So you do a compensatory osteotomy. You valgize it, you internally rotate it, and you flex it. So this is what is the concept of a compensatory osteotomy. And advantages are able to correct most clinical deformity relatively much safer than, than modified than osteotomy, but technically much less demanding. So my indication is that it is uh, just one second. Sorry, uh, my indication is, is uh, for doing a severe stable slip, but not necessarily a restricted flexion. I don't think it can correct restricted flexion much as compared to a modified done osteotomy. So modified done in osteotomy can be done in some cases. So this was a 15 year old male with left hip pain since eight months, had a history of fall five months back and has now started walking since two months with significant pain and limp and is unable to sit cross-legged and squat. So that is a very important history. You can see that you can, can't even do a proper frog leg lateral view. So that is very, very important. Uh, inability to sit cross-legged and squat. So this has been described by Carl Zibat et al. In, in, in their technique. A brief few slides about the method, a lateral deep cubitus method. Uh, the incision is centered on the tip of the greater trochanter, about 8 centimeters distal, 8 centimeters proximal. After the incision, the facial cut is in the same plane of the incision. You can see that the diagastric flap is made by the vastus lateralis, the gluteus medius. And this is where the trochanteric osteotomy is between the vastus lateralis and the gluteus medius. It is initially started off with a saw and then completed using a 15 millimeter curved osteotome. Once you do that, this flap is then flipped anteriorly so as to expose the anterior capsule like so. A capsulotomy is done in a Z manner so as to expose the femoral head. 
This is then dislocated anteriorly using a bone hook around the femoral neck by flexion, adduction, and external rotation. The ligamentum teres is exposed and which is cut with the help of a strong Mayo scissor like so. And this is when the head is completely dislocated and the leg is put in the bag which is created anteriorly. The retinacular flap which is from the lesser trochanter to the greater trochanter to the femoral head and which contains the blood supply is cut anteriorly sharply, retracted away so as to clear the entire metaphysis of the proximal femur. A cleavage plane is created in the, in the, meta, in the physis and with the help of gentle reduction using an osteotome, this is then reduced in valgus fixed retrogradely with two wires of which one of them can be converted into a screw. The wire is pulled back like so, cut and bent. The retinacular flap is loosely sutured with few sutures. This is at that time, we should check the bleeding with the help of a small puncture and then relocated back. The capsule is loosely sutured and the trochanter is fixed back using two 3.5 mm particle screws. So this is the same case. You can see that excellent correction with the help of the modified done procedure. This is the immediate post-op. The child started walking well in about three months, having good flexion. And this is six months post-op showing good reduction and two years post-op. Here the child, you can't even make out which side of the hip is being operated. He's doing all activities with no lurch. So my indication is only for very severe slips where there is restricted flexion and inability to sit cross-legged or squat. As Venkat said, it is an extremely technically challenging procedure with a relatively high risk of avian. Thus, my plan for a hip preservation in slip, if it's a mild slip, pre-slip or a contralateral slip, just do an in-C2 pinning. If it's a mild to moderate slip and the child has come with a significant anterior hip pain, which means that there is an anterior cam, do an in situ pinning with an anterior osteoplasty. If you are skilled in the scopy, then scopy, then otherwise, otherwise a small anterior incision. If it's a severe slip where the child is able to sit cross legged and swat, you can do a compensatory proximal femoral osteotomy. But if he is unable to sit cross legged or squat, you have to do a modified done osteotomy. Thank you very much. So, Manda, that was a great talk. Uh, my question to you is, uh, see, there are some patients with chronic slip where they have developed external rotation contracture due to uh, external rotator tightness yeah. and not uh, due to the impingement. You know How you decide that in which patients you would wait? Well, some of them, once we fix in C2, uh, that external rotation deformity resolves over a period of time. So when you make decision that uh, you will do osteoplasty and when you would wait? Uh, so again, it's relatively rare for the child to have an external rotation contracture per se without a significant bony deformity. What happens when there is uh, such a thing uh, in, in, in especially chronic slips, you may see that the head neck junction is not very displaced, but there is significant retroversion of the femoral neck. And that is what causes the external rotation deformity. So the modified done procedure can correct both of them. You can do a shortening osteotomy. You may have to take a slightly bigger wedge and then tighten the abductors more so. So I feel that just having an external rotation deformity without a significant uh, uh, head neck jun junction deformity, it means that there may be a compensatory neck deformity which you may have to correct. Yeah, see some what happens, you know, some chronic stable slips, they have uh, long-standing effusions. Correct. And so I have seen some of them resolving. Uh, Only, yeah. Uh, if I may interrupt. The yeah, please. The tissue contracture is secondary to the bony problem here. So the bony problem is the primary one. Absolutely. The slip is the primary problem and the soft tissue problem is secondary to the bony problem. So the modified then addresses both. When you're raising the retinocular flap, actually you are, uh, no, sort of uh, the flap is erasing the external rotators. So when you're raising the retinocular flap, you are removing the bone of the external rotators, short external rotators. So it frees the external rotators. The soft tissue contracture is addressed by that part. And the osteotomy is addressing the bony problem. 
so it corrects both the problems yeah, yeah. i am i am talking about those uh, you know uh, chronic stable and mild to moderate slips uh, i would say mild slips where we just fix it in c2 you know and then some of them have extra rotation posture of the limb, which corrects. In one of these option of Mandar's algorithm was to uh, do in C2 and osteoplasty. So my question was about that subgroup of patients, you know. So again, there are two subgroups where uh, of presentation. As I said, one is where they present with an abnormal gait with an external rotation gait. So outgoing gait basically. And on X-ray, you see a slip and you need to fix it like that. So in that case, you may fix it. You tell them that it is uh, primarily going to be because you have a slip which is going to progress further. So it's basically to prevent slip progression. If the child comes very specifically with an anterior hip pain, that is something which you need to correct with an anterior osteoblast. It is a very specific subset. They, they say that and so the kids like that, they are quite they are quite intelligent that 13 or 14 years of age, they know exactly what they are complaining of. They have anterior pain, they have pain on high flexion activities. So that is the thing which you want to resolve. And that is not going to be resolved with just an NC2 pain. You need something to relieve that, that cam impingement anteriorly. And that is why you require an anterior osteoplasty. And so, simple yeah. procedure, open procedure, simple, small, we just reflect the, uh, retract the rectus, go anteriorly and you can just do a burying. So is it, would it be right to say that the conventional teaching that stable slips should be fixed with in C2 peening and unstable should be uh, open? But it seems that with uh, stable but very severe slips, there also there are chances of impingement and you have to do modified done. Is, is that right? Because that was the traditional teaching when we were uh, fellows that you don't uh, open this table slip, just fix it in C2. And if it is anything is there, if it fails to remodel, then you do secondary procedure. Does that hold right today also or we, are cha we have changed the algorithm in those? It depends on... on uh, uh... How much you are comfortable with doing a, doing a modified done procedure? If you are not, then probably the safer way is to put pin it in C2. At least, at least prevent the prog problem from progressing. And you can do a safely a derotation osteotomy or a, a proximal femoral compensatory osteotomy, which is a relatively safe procedure. It's a standard procedure which you can do. Right? So, so um, uh, I think I think it depends on your comfort or expertise in doing the modified done procedure. Which who, who which, in my hands, I feel it is it is the best uh, uh, about for all kinds of slips. I do it for stable as well as unstable slips. Uh, all moderate to severe slips, I do it. But again, it depends on the expertise. It's not wrong if if the uh, person does an in C two with the proximal femoral femoral derotation osteotomy. Right. So, any any other question from delegates? What is the exact level of osteotomy for proximal femur osteotomy? So, it is typically intertrochanteric. Uh, so, just below the greater trochanter and just above the lesser trochanter, like an oblique osteotomy, which you can then fix it with either a, a blade plate or a proximal femoral LCP. You're right. So, uh, yes, so this is a great priming before we attend this media meeting, you know, there will be more uh, direct interactions and uh, question and answers there. So I think uh, if we don't have any further question, uh, we should conclude today's session. Modified done for stable. Do you feel any issues while doing resection? Yes. So it's a very tough uh, surgery to do in a, in a stable slip. You uh, require to really, really release uh, on both sides, and uh, it's it's it. So Prasad describes it as a, as a uh, femoral neck osteotomy, 
uh, uh, for stable and healed slips. So basically, you have to do a complete osteotomy or the cuneiform osteotomy rather than so in in a in an unstable slip, it's a relatively simpler procedure uh, where the cleavage plane has always already been made. Here, you have to to exactly decide what is the exact cleavage plane, which sometimes is very difficult to do. Right. So, uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mandar and Venkat, for those uh, great, you. great talks. And I'm sure that fellows would go, uh, go back and go through these lectures again, and they would understand uh, it better. And my, they might come up with their own questions when uh, they meet you in the media meeting. So, thank you very much. And next week we'll meet uh, with more bit uh, advanced talk with, with Prasad Gurnani. So, Mandar, you have to moderate that session next weekend. Thank you very much. Take Bye. care, everyone. Bye-bye.